Hey guys, Ali Hussaini here with Local Knowledge and BD Outdoors. If you know me, you know one of my biggest passions. It's sort of been a dream come true over the last few years here in Southern California, but it's this giant bluefin fishery. And I'm really stoked to be here tonight, partnered with AFCO to celebrate the release of their new film, Year of the Bluefin, and also sit down with some guys that love bluefin just as much as I do. They've got a different take on bluefin. You've probably heard enough from me. And these guys are as passionate as I am. It's going to be killer to sit down with them and really go through the different faces of this bluefin fishery that have developed recently in our waters. So to kick off this, this to kick off this discussion, I wanted to have you guys watch the film, enjoy the film. Afterwards, we'll start a little roundtable with some Q and A. We'll take your questions via the YouTube chat, and we'll answer those directly as well. So, with no further ado, let's check out Year of the Bluefin. You know, I can date everything back to when I was a child and when you're a little kid and you think of catching big fish and on rod and reel and how do you do this stuff and how do you land a 200 pound fish on rod and reel and well, I hope someday I get to do that and gee, maybe someday I'll actually get to pull on one of those big bluefin tuna and am I going to be strong enough to land it? Is my tackle going to break? Ever since I was a kid, a bluefin tuna was sort of a mysterious creature in California. So in 2015, when this big fish showed up and we caught the first over 100 pound fish just off the east end of Catalina, we were all ecstatic because now we've got that fish that was so romanticized all through the history of sport fishing. I mean, literally the beginnings of rod and reel sport fishing. That fish was now back. Well, it, it really all starts with Catalina Island. Out in the blue Pacific, 20 miles as the flying fish flies, lies Santa Catalina Island, a fisherman's paradise abounding with swordfish and leaping tuna in fathomless waters reflecting the blue of the sky, bathed in glorious sunshine. We're going to start from the Tuna Club, the most famous fishing club in the world, whose membership includes celebrities from all over. Our boatman is waiting to take us out to the fishing grounds, and we'll do battle with the most spectacular fighter of the Pacific. And we're anticipating the thrill of a lifetime. When you see that big beast with that big blue eye and the teeth and the, that, that pretty kind of purplish blue, that opalescent kind of pearl blue color, that just fires me up. We were lucky enough here three years ago to go out on a tagging mission with a woman by the name of Dr. Barbara Block out of Stanford University. Barbara Block is the world's leading authority on bluefin tuna. She wanted us to catch her a bluefin tuna that was in that over 200 pound class so that she could determine how ready that fish was to spawn. They don't spawn here, they spawn across the Pacific over by Taiwan. And so she needed a fish that she could put an archival tag in, which is a tag they actually sew into the belly of the fish. We were lucky enough to catch her the only 250 pound bluefin tuna that she's done this with. This fish came back exactly one year later, the tag popped up, and she located the tag off 80 miles off Monterey, same exact time of year. These fish essentially do a big giant figure eight off the coast of California. They go up about as high as Southern Oregon, Northern California, and they go down about as low as Guadalupe Island, which is roughly 300 miles south of here. The top of that figure eight used to be down off of Guadalupe Island. So we essentially never had access to those fish, through that period of time from roughly 1935 until we caught those fish in 2015.
just the, the bulkiness, the size, I mean, you just look at that fish and go, that is a predator that just is gonna kick ass on anything around. The speed and power and the level of respect we have for them, when they turn the water full-blown white, that's unusual. Uh, it was a funny thing. Before I hooked that big blue fin, I get a little choked up saying this, but my son was a, Na was a Navy nuke engineer and he passed away uh, a few years ago. And I um, always thought of him as, whenever I see birds, I think of my boy, I think about all this. And before I caught my big blue fin, we're sitting there drifting with our flying fish out and this lace on albatross is circling the boat. And they're usually pretty shy and they go away and this thing comes over and lands next to the boat and I'm feeding it sardines. And every time I feed it a sardine, it gets a little closer. It gets a little closer. Well, I had my linen line right out over the top of this albatross, and I'm thinking of my son and how much he loved to fish and all that. And, and uh, I fed him a sardine. He kind of shook his head, ate the sardine, and he, he swam over in the water, and, and this is the God's truth. He got his head in my linen line, and he kind of went like that, and got, shook his head and got the linen line off him, and he flew off. I'm like, well, that was really weird. So why was he, what's going on there? And then my brother yells down, he goes, oh, it's Zane. He came in to visit you. 15 minutes later, the rod goes off. I hook my bluefin and I land my blue button, bluefin tuna. All right, guys, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed the film. I've got a couple friends here with me, Craig Stotesbury, formerly of AFCO for, what, 100 years or so <laughs> there? Uh, 33. 33, <laughs> close enough. And Ryan Griffin. Uh, I've known both these guys for quite a while. 
Ryan, what's your relationship with AFCO? I know you're sponsored, but it seems like you're kind of part of the family over there. Yeah, I think I have a close relationship with a lot of guys that work there, and I, I think I've been on the team so long now that I've gotten to know everybody kind of intimately, and uh, the, the relationship is just, uh, you know, it, it's definitely like family. Right on. Well, I would like to thank AFCO again for bringing us together to do this. This is going to be fun for all of us. Believe me, I know at the trade shows and stuff, Greg and I can sit around talking bluefin till we're blue in the face. It's something that I think we both enjoy. And we have some very different perspectives sitting at this table. And I think that's probably the most exciting thing. Um, Greg, tell us a little bit about what bluefin means to you. I know maybe the way Ryan and I tend to catch them is a lot more similar than the way you like to do it. You, you're that guy that likes to make things hard on himself. Well, it's, you know, because I'm a, a member of the Avalon Tuna Club, I'm, I'm kind of bound by our rules as far as the tackle that, that we sanction, which would be either Dacron line or linen line. We don't really recognize anything caught on monofilament or any of the modern modern lines. So in turn, that pushes you towards this kind of gear and trying to land those big fish on it. And admittedly, when this fish first showed up, I just wanted to catch one. I didn't care what, what it was on, yep, any, yep. any pound spectra, yep. whatever. But uh, now that we've caught quite a few of them in the last six or eight years, it's been fun to, to challenge myself and to to go after some of the buttons and awards and medallions that we have in the club on linen antique tackle like what's sitting here in front of us. So that's kind of been my my uh, my real focus the last the last number of years. I think it's weird, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on. But this whole thing started by the tuna club, and it's kind of come full circle. Like you know, when I try to explain this to somebody else, I'm like we're doing stuff that they figured out 100 years ago and we're not we didn't change much no it you know it was it was interesting that the, the first year i think it was 2015 when we caught that 131 pounder off the east end that i i believe and i was told by many that that was the first over 100 pound local bluefin caught um in the area of catalina island mm -hmm. and um when we caught that fish soon after that i called an old time tuna club member that has since retired down to new zealand guy by the name of jerry garrett who holds more buttons and trophies in the tuna club than anybody and the first thing Jerry said to me is, is if you want to catch those big bluefin, you got to use flying fish. He says, get a flying fish and put an 11 hook on it and put it underneath the kite. That's, I mean, that was his exact words. And I thought, 11 hook, bluefin? No, no, no. It's got to be a live bait. It's got to be a long soak. We caught that first fish on a live squid. We were in a sea bass tournament and found a blitter and caught it. Like a little squid. Yeah, like, like a market squid. Wow. And uh, But anyway, it, it, when Jerry said that to use the flying fish to catch these big bluefin, Soon after that, we started experimenting around with the kite and with rig, rig flying fish, and we started having success. Yeah, for us, it was a yummy. That kicked it all off. Yeah. Like late 2015, Yeah, some of the Cabo guys I'd heard from were like, hey, don't tell anybody, but there's some giant tuna out on the 43. Go catch one. And I'm like, what? Yeah. You couldn't even believe it, right? <laughs> I'm like, well, what do you do to catch them? They're like, do the Cabo program. And we used to use a rig mackerel, and we'd skip mackerel underneath the kite, the yeah. yellowfin and cobbler port of my yard. I'm sure, sure you guys have done it. Oh yeah, yeah. And it was like, okay, well, let's go give it a try. I don't think we had the bait up for 15 minutes. Yeah. And we caught a 165. And I put it all over the internet, it broke the internet. It was oh, the greatest yeah. thing ever. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, I mean, so how, I know Ryan, you got a different angle and yours usually ends up in a plate of delicious food that I want makes me want to eat my Instagram <laughs> on my phone. There's been some of that, yeah. Yeah, so like, what what is like, what's this meant to you? How did you stumble into it? I know, you know, you you love it as much as anybody. Well, you know, luckily for me, I had spent a lot of time fishing in Puerto Vallarta. Um, and, and I had several seasons under my belt down there of uh, chasing big yellowfin at the Trace Maria. So, you know, all of a sudden the rumors are going around that 2015 year, there's fish around. And, you know, same thing as you heard, you know, the Yummy Flyers gotten some bites for some people. And first day out there, you know, we found some fish, thought we saw some breezers, not really sure, never had really seen anything before quite like it, put the Yummy up and we ended up with four fish that day. Holy moly. And um, that was and 15 or 16? That was 2015. Wow. And that, and that was the first like, uh, oh my God, what happened? Yeah. And, um, and and so from there, obviously we've come to where we are today, which is in, you know light years in terms of uh, how we're fishing for them. But for me, yeah, the, the, what it meant to me was just this incredible uh, phenomenon in our back year that you know is coming full circle again after so many years it's been forgotten by generations that we that even we know of right and so here we are catching these fish and then me having a background with food i mean i just go nuts with that bluefin and and turn it into just amazing culinary stuff that's just i mean people love that and i love sharing it with people and stuff for me the fish is about you know something i can go out bring back and wow people with you know friends family yeah kind of stuff. I'm a tuna nerd. I think if you grew up in San Diego, I know you're a big Marlin guy. When you're a San Diego guy, it's all about tuna growing up. Like that's the thing, right? You graduate from Calico's to Yellowtail to tuna. Yep. 
And Florida Vallarta, I got the bug. I was down there in the early, early days, 03, 04. It changed my life. It really, it literally changed my life. Seeing those big fish and learning how to catch them and buck for them. And, and that was an exciting time with the invention of braid and, you know, the bigger lever drag reels and all that stuff. I mean, it, it was a perfect transition, I think, for a lot of us, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah, we were lucky that we had the gear and the knowledge to do that in 2015, which is really, you know, what sparked the big push, right? Everybody, had, everyone had to learn how to fly a kite. Everyone had to learn how to go out and use the yummy properly. And so, you know, I mean, now we've got professional tuna fishermen, you know. <laughs> it reminded me of like, Grossbeck was telling me when the Blue Marlin showed up here and they went out and got that first one. Yeah. You know, it's like, well, it, we were just wearing jackets instead of t-shirts and we got bit and we ran our program. And next right. thing you know, you know what I mean? It was like, I feel like we were well prepared for it from other places. Um, so let's talk about the old days and this gets me really excited. I try to explain to people, like I get to talk to people from Florida a ton. I spent a bunch of time back there as you do. And when I try to describe this fishery to them right now, you can't, you just cannot, like, it's not the best fishing this decade. It's not the best fishing in 20 years. It's not the best fishing in 50 years. Like this has not happened for a hundred years. Right. And this is what gave birth, if I'm not mistaken, to the tuna club at Avalon, right? It's exactly what, what caused the birds at the tuna club. They were they were catching those fish before 1898. They were catching those fish on hand lines and boat lines and all kinds of tarred line and everything else. And, you know, hand lining them to the boat and then killing them. And most of the time they just went to waste. And then uh, a guy by the name of C.F. Holder, Charles F. Holder, who's a doctor from Pasadena, got the same guy that founded the Rose Parade and was involved with wow. a lot of a lot of that stuff back in those days. He brought some tackle to to Catalina that was essentially tarpon tackle, and and caught the first big bluefin tuna on on rod and reel tackle under current style you know regulations mm -hmm. like fight a fish or whatever. And um, he caught that fish, and then he and I think five or six other guys got together that were all guys that were fishing out of Avalon at the time. They were wealthy guys that lived mainland and they would go to Avalon in the summer and fish for tuna and yellowtail and marlin and everything else. And he, they established some, some basic rules around the catch and around the pursuit. And basically it's a, it's a, it was a fair play game and it was a gentleman's sport. And so they developed the sizes of tackle and the methods and the techniques. And, and you know, and that caused the evolution of all of this gear. I mean, Guys like Boshin and Farnsworth and all these these uh, these names at the time that were back there, they were the guys that invented, invented the lever drag reel, the outrigger, the fishing kite for George Farnsworth, and that was developed right at Catalina. And then it kind of went back east and everyone kind of took hold of it back there and felt like they invented it and now all of a sudden it's come back here again. So it was, um, it's a very much a full circle thing, but the history of the tuna club was one of, it was really based on bluefin tuna and then in the 1920s, 22, 24, something like that, the bluefin tuna basically disappeared. And they blamed it on Persanes and they blamed it on all these different things. But the bottom line is the bluefin just moved. Mm -hmm. And I think when we weighed that 131 pounder in 2015, I think that was the biggest fish since the early 30s. Oh, that was caught near Catalina. Now there was some Guadalupe fish that were brought yep. up and weighed. Yep. And the tuna club actually allowed an exception for Guadalupe back in the day. But basically the, the club was built on bluefin tuna and then it evolved to marlin and swordfish when the bluefin left. But the very first sport caught bluefin tuna, the very first sport caught marlin, and the very first sport caught broadbill swordfish were all caught at the Avalon Tuna. It's incredible. And they all hang, but the old half mounts are still there in the club. And now when you're talking about that old gear, right? It's one thing to talk about it, but I mean, the reality of it, those were knuckle buster reels, correct? Yeah, there was no, there was no anti reverse. So that means that when the fish took drag, the reel handle spun backwards. Go ahead and put your hand into that thing while it's spinning backwards with a 200 pound blue fin attached. Not gonna end well. There were there were honestly lots and lots of injuries. Broken fingers, broken hands, think all broken wrists. Lots of tragedies, lots of fish fought for hours and hours, hours and lost. Um, fish fought and rods breaking, which by the way, I had a fish that was a possible club record this year on nine thread and broke the rod after an hour and a half. Oh. <laughs> a bamboo rod that was 70 years old, but anyway, that happened a lot, and a lot of failures of the reels, and guys getting drug out to sea. They're fishing in a little rowboat. Yeah, crazy. And uh, so it was, it was, uh, it was very much the roots of sport fishing and, and offshore big game fishing. And and then as it's evolved over the years, you know, the, the rules that IGFA uses as far as fair play and catch and leader length, and you know, the techniques that guys use, and you know, fighting the rod, you know, holding the rod and standing up to the fish and all that. That all came as a result of what the tuna club started back at the turn of the century. So it was. 
very much the roots of everything in big game started right there at Catalina Island in the Tim Park. Don't tell the Florida guys they didn't invite that <laughs> Invent kite fishing. They lose their mind. They literally, it's been so long, they really think that they invented kite fishing. Oh, I've yeah. gotten into arguments with guys like, no, sorry, it didn't yeah. really start there. Yeah, It's crazy. One other thing that blows my mind about these guys landing these fish, like something, describe the drag system that they use. Well, the drag system that they used was basically a leather, what they call a thumb stall, thumb pass. that they press down on the line as the fish is running, and they would, they would, what they call give the fish the butt, which they would pull back on the rod, on a wooden rod, and not nearly as, as flexible or as modern as this is, relatively. Broomsticks. Um, it was basically a broomstick with three guides on it, and a big, long butt like this, but they would push down on that thumb stall to try to stall the fish out. 150 pound bluefin and you're going to push with a little piece of leather with the no answer reverse yeah it's smoke coming off of it and everything you know wire leaders and yeah it's amazing they landed anything but you know so many of those club records that were caught legit on that tackle they still stand to this day that's mm -hmm. crazy what are some of the unbreakables uh some of the unbreakable records yeah like well, the ones that are still standing you guys <laughs> haven't broken them in recent years it's probably some of the swordfish stuff some of the swordfish stuff for sure i mean the you know, the, the very first large bluefin, I think it was 261, that was caught on 24th wow. Linen, and still stands. That's insane. Um, they're uh, Jimmy Jump's uh, light tackle fish, which, which was, a, I think, either a nine, six or a nine thread fish, which is the one I was trying to break this year. Um, that fish is 144 pounds, and it was caught in the 20s. And, wow. and we had a fish to color, basically done this year. It was over 150 pounds. And the rod broke. Right and when you say six <laughs> thread and nine thread, what's that equivalent? To? So six thread is it's three times in a perfect world is three times the the size. So six thread is eighteen pound test. Not nine thread would be twenty seven pound test. And so the nine thread that I had actually tested about twenty four pounds. And this hundred fifty pound fish was just one of those ones that was it was catchable and it was flat calm. It was perfect. But when the rod breaks, fish is DQ. It doesn't count. It's over. I don't catch a lot of fish on 27 pound test. Do you right? Really try to stay it? away from it as much as possible. I'm a big 30 pound test guy. Myself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's insane. It's just the numbers are insane and not having a boat to chase them and they're not backing down and, and, and. Yeah. I mean, we have so many advantages these days and they're still hard to sell to catch. Yeah, it's, it's uh, like I said, a bunch of those records are still standing for a reason. That's it's crazy. Not, not easy to do. So, what about the timeline? Because, like, I'm sure you guys share the same anxiety that I do, right? Every spring, I'm like, Oh shit! Are they coming back? Is yeah. it gonna happen? Like, what? Yeah. What do we go back to? I mean, we had a great fishery here before. Don't get me wrong, but I wasn't stacking two hundred pound tuna and seeing some of those amazing blue stuff, blue planet yeah. stuff every time I left. What do we do with all the tackle when that fish goes right? away? <laughs> 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 no, 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 no surplus, a big heavy reels. tackle. Yeah, save your receipts. I mean, my understanding was it was kind of like nineteen oh five to like nineteen eighteen was the real meat of that run. Is that, that was, about right? That's true. So yeah. a dozen ish years. Yeah, less than about a dozen years, but Bar Barbara Block is, every time I've talked to her at length about the bluefin to that, that's Dr. Block from, from Stanford, she always says, don't get too used to this fish being here because it's going to cycle out of here for sure. And she said originally, I, I, as I recall, somewhere in the four to seven year range, mm -hmm. I think we're on year number six now, and there's just as much, if not more than ever, but eventually that fish is going to cycle out or the decadal oscillation or something with the ocean currents is going to change as it did to bring that fish here in 2015. And when that happens, here come the albacore. <laughs> We're back to catch an albacore again. Keep those if I never see another albacore, I want these bluefin to stay forever or some bigger yellowfin anyway. Yeah, it would, it'll be a shame when, when they, if and when they do go away. But um, but I, I think it's pretty much a foregone conclusion that these are eventually going to cycle out of here and either we're not going to get them or they're going to you know, their migration is going to end up at Guadalupe Island instead of Catalina Island mm -hmm. and Monterey and everything else and, and uh, have to find other things to catch. Yeah, well, we have plenty to do beforehand, but it's just been such a gift. Like, that's what I mean when I talk to these guys from other parts of the country. I don't, I mean, the only thing for me, like bigger bluefin, bigger yellowfin, I'll take yellowfin all day. I just think they're the harder fighting cousin. I just, I don't know, I love yellowfin. Mm -hmm. But number two would definitely be big bluefin, and we've had so much of it now, and uh, we've gotten so used to it. I don't want to see it go, but I also feel like the El Nino that we had was so intense that it kind of changed something that brought them here. How long does that effect last for? I know this year was a little bit different in our waters, and especially down here. Like this was a cold water year for us. Yeah, for sure. Years prior have been warm. When I saw squid and sea bass out in front of Mission Bay, 
that ain't normal right. you know and they were there for a while so and and like and then got buddies up in washington right and jason and i would have visited them 10 years ago we're having whiskeys around the fireplace and we're talking i'm like dude do not get used to this fisher they're like oh we're gonna kill these things forever they're never going away i'm like <laughs> so little do you know I, i'm like i promise you they will cycle out of here now their season up there is two or three weeks yeah of albacore and that sure. tells me they're moving north and what happens when they hit the north end they spin back down yeah. around and they start coming into guadalupe and then a couple years later we have albacore yeah. yeah so i don't know what to make of it but i think something different I mean, what have you guys seen that makes you think something's changing up, up on your end I mean, one thing that I think you have to consider is that, you know, I mean, obviously look at what Barbara Block's trying to do. She's trying to find out whether these fish are spawning, you know, determine what the spawning cycle really is of these fish. And, and the information, it, you know, is in my understanding, if you were to determine that we have a spawning body of fish here, it would suggest a, a far greater population overall of bluefin than we realize, which would suggest that we're going to, you know, have pro prolific, pro pro what's the word? I mean, abundant fishing for some time to come. I mean, who knows how long the cycle could be, you know, 12 years, 10 years, three years. Obviously we're kind of getting to that point now where it's like, well, we're starting to count on these things, Dude, you know? seriously. I mean, we're, we're watching the clock tick, you know, and it's, you can almost hit it on the head with a hammer if you're, if you're paying attention, right? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, what do you think? Well, what, what, what these fish do is they make an 8,000 mile migration. Yep. So they spawn off of Taiwan, which they, we covered some of that in the film. And then they come back here and they kind of just figure eight up and down off our coast that that big fish that she put the tag in that was, that was in the in the film there um the, the tag popped exactly one year it was a one year tag it popped one year later and it was 80 miles off monterey which kind of fits with with this big figure eight that they're doing with the bottom of that figure eight being about guadalupe maybe in the dead of winter and the top of it being somewhere above monterey so she said those fish will figure eight and what she's trying to determine is at what size do they go, okay, I've been here long enough, I'm going to split and go across well, and I think, go to the other side. And I, that's the next thing I wanted to touch on. I think we can answer that question. It's about 350 pounds. Yeah. yeah. Right? We're, we haven't, well, there, I, so I heard of a couple 400. That would be like a for sure, though. You know, I think yeah. I think a mature, sexually mature fish could theoretically be 250. Yeah, 250. Yep. So, 250 to 300 pounds. You know, we see a lot of 250 pound class fish. That's, yeah. and so that's where, like, I think that question we're pretty clear on, but, right? They aren't, if they were staying here, we would have seen fours and fives and sixes. And, and in the case of this season, that's been one of the cooler things is watching the average. I mean, just a few years ago, the average fish was like 115. Yeah. You know, guys are calling them sure. 200s, but sure. they, it was not a huge tuna. This year, yeah. our average fish was like ridiculous. Yeah. 185 to 225. I mean, in days, every fish we caught was 200 plus. Yeah. yeah, That hasn't happened in the cycle. I don't know what that means per se, but like stuff's changing. That's what I know. Yeah, I, yeah. I think it is. I think the stuff's proteining up and eventually a lot of it's gonna go across. And you know, the whole goal of her deal is to try to develop a management plan so that when those fish go to Taiwan and they spawn and then all of those those overseas fleets are fishing on that basically eight to 15 pound fish and taking it out of the out of the uh, population pool that's what she's trying to do is get some restrictions on that yeah so that some of that fish can to get big enough to make the out eight thousand mile crossing come here protein up and then go back across again yeah the yeah. other thing is i mean look at the diversity in the schools that we see right? right i mean we've got everything from 10 pounds to essentially over 300 pounds and maybe bigger we're just we're not sure right i mean there could yeah. be some bigger fish here but it's hard to get through to them right yeah. um but you got just every size in the, in the spectrum here from the beach out to 100 miles offshore yeah i remember when we worked with dr block she didn't she wasn't as excited about the big fish as she was about the little fish right she's yeah. like i'm seeing acres and acres of these eight to 20 pound fish which is not that unusual for us to get but right. like i remember bluefin growing up was always something you kind of got a crack at for like a month every year between sure. the yeah. Yeah, and yeah. shit, you know and they wouldn't they didn't want to bite really good and yeah you know they were super finicky but then all of a sudden something would trigger them and yeah. we go out and we catch 20 bluefin yeah. after picking one or two off so yeah. I don't really know how all that relates, but it's hard to imagine. Like now with the mixed schools, just like you said, right? You'll go throw, you know, a little metal lure into a, a school of forty pounders, and next thing you know, you're being towed around by a two hundred pounder sure. for yeah. you know a couple of and hours. What, what does that mean for the big picture? I, I, I'm as curious as anybody. It's it's been so great. I I just I wish I wish we understood more what to expect. Maybe it goes for twenty years. I don't know. I, I can tell you this: that school right there, where they have the where they have the drone up. And Michael and I, my brother and I, have done a lot of running around out there. That school was straight 100, 200 pound fish. And who knows how much bigger than that? And 
it was the largest single school of big ones that I've, I've ever seen anywhere at really? any time. And it was, we were actually, we had left the 499 and we're coming down the backside of Catalina at about four in the afternoon when we found that school. And it was massive. I mean, what you see when the drone pulls away and the, and the boats in the background, or our boats parked in the back, and you see the size of that school and you, you realize how much fish, I mean, I don't know if in per se numbers what they call the size of that school, but it was mega tonnage, volume. Yeah. Mega volume. Mega, mega you know, tonnage, 30, yeah. 40, 50, 100 ton. I don't know what it was. Well, when you, some of those schools, you'll run over them and they only go down 30 feet, you know, on your on your sounder. Some of those schools will go down 300 yes. feet. Yeah. The yeah. amount of carne that is there yeah. is, I don't think you can get your head around it. Yeah. You know, think of how tall a 300 foot building is. No. Yeah. And imagine a wall of meat with fins. It's like that's going that big. It's just it's crazy. Some of the, the things that we've seen. Yeah. I believe yeah. we have big fish here though too. You know, I mean Carl, Arapilakia, Carl. I, I mean he's he's had pictures of you know three and four fish together that are just stupidly bigger than the rest of what anybody else is seeing. You know, and it's like well it's hard to gauge what we're looking at exactly. But yeah, those are those are different than three hundred pounds. But I trust those guys completely. That's yep. their job. They were counted at you know a mess of fish where we're like holy crap. I think, I think Carl like, yeah, that's what he's looking at. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. I and I agree with you. All of the pictures, folklore, tower shots, all yeah. the stuff that I've seen of those big, big ones has been like three little, fish. Little flying four bee. fish. Exactly. Yeah. Just a couple of yeah. fish. And you know, when we're out there chasing them, honestly we're not gonna see three or four fish. You yeah. Know, we yeah. need a, we either need them under the boat or we get them on the meter yeah. or we need a pretty good spot or we're honestly just probably gonna drive past them. We've had a couple of times where we've come up on tailors that were yeah. that were breezing and you know, dorsal and tail and We've had enough of them on the deck and looked at enough of them that some of those fish, Michael and I both looked at them and went, that fish has got to be way over 300. Yeah. I mean, the fins were just yeah, right. the size of a marlin. Right. Yeah. And, you and know, tailing like, like a big tuna shell. Tailing, like, yeah. you know, tailing <laughs> down swell. And not just one, but a little a little group of five Wolf or six. Packs. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. And who knows how big those were, but it's sure. fun to think about. <laughs> so, well, okay, Greg, what's your theory or both of you guys? Remember, everybody knows the story in the late 80s. Up there, yeah. in Santa Rosa. Sure. Right. It was real giants. Sure. Real, real giants. Thousand pounders. Yeah. I don't even know. I mean, do they normally get that big in the Asian Sea? I don't think so. Right. That's the only place I hear in the Pacific is in the South Pacific. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Australia, New Zealand, they get those giants, but they had to come from somewhere. You sure. know what I mean? Like, I, I, how does that relate to what we're seeing now? I don't. I don't know. It was a pretty anomalous thing that happened. And what I heard was, I heard that those guys were setting on one or two fish. Yeah, wrapping and they were, individuals. And they were seen at night. They would yeah. find them with the airplane at night on the phosphorus and they would set on the phosphorus and when they first up they'd have an eight hundred pounder, a nine hundred pounder, and a five hundred pounder. There'd be three fish. Oh I didn't I so it I wasn't heard schools. That. It wasn't a whole No, school it wasn't wrapping. schools. It was it was it was fewer than ten fish. Oh okay. And they were seeing it with the airplane. At least this is the stories that I heard firsthand from and there was a well-known tuna club uh, member dave denho who took his boat the espadon espadon up there and he uh, hooked one and fought it for a long time you know yeah. massive fish oh really lost it you know, oh, okay had yeah. the right gear had you know one of the few boats with a fighting chair mm -hmm. and the right tackle but went up there with you know tuna club you know heavy tackle okay and uh in the 27 pound test <laughs> yeah <laughs> good luck buddy what's <laughs> heavy tackle they call it heavy tackle That's so like heavy tackle 100 pound right or 80 pound 80 pound, 80 right. pound right. the heaviest tuna club recognizes is 80 pound dacron right or 24 thread linen which this is sure and 24 thread linen like I say, on its best day, it's 72, 74 pounds. Right. Okay. So that's the heaviest of the two. That's dry, left. laundered, clean. You that's know, it. Way. That's it. Perfect. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and when it's 80 years old, who knows? But sure. But uh, yeah, I, uh, that big fish that was up there, I don't know. That's some kind of an anomaly, and I, I don't really know what that means. Yeah, and that's like the thing with these fish are like the guys have all these crazy theories of, I don't know what they're based on, but they're like, no, there's got to be 500s and 600s and all of this. And these fish have been here for years. We just didn't. Bull crap. No, right. no, 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 I right. mean, if there's a fish that you know is in town, yeah. there is no more fish that you will know when they're around that are blue fin tuna, yeah. right? Yeah. It's their job to foam and sure. jump out of the water. And Here I, feel, I am. Yeah, I mean, I've flown the spotter plane myself, and you look, you can see a foamer from a million yep. miles yep. away. I've even taken off out of San Diego on commercial flights and looked down and gone foamer, foamer, That's foamer. Amazing. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I don't buy that they've been around yeah. or they're running deep or sure. any of that. No, no. Crap. Know, and that that fish has got to have a lot of fuel, so it's got to be up on the bait and feeding. I yeah, mean, it's got to be around All massive, massive amounts of bait, like we have this year. And when we say bait, right? So I think the first couple of years, the main draw, at least to kick the season off, was that red crab. Yeah, yeah. Fortunately, we haven't seen any of those things for a little bit. Yeah, they kind of screw up everything. 
But then that seemed like as the first couple seasons, I think the first two seasons, lots of red crab and then transition to anchovy as they pushed out to the 43, the island and beyond, right? So now it's Chovy. I think I haven't seen him eat anything but Chovy, you know, really for the last couple of seasons, other than a fluke, you know, sure. chasing flying fish or salaries. Yeah. Would you guys agree with that? I, everything that we've cleaned has been just stuffed with anchovy. Yeah. yeah. I, I can't think that I've seen anything but anchovy and one or two times flying fish that had been rigged that they had picked off somebody mm-hmm. else's line. I have seen, I've caught with them with broken wings yep. and sometimes with, with a popsicle stick in them yeah, still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Saw some squid this year though. Yeah. So a couple years ago when they were posted up on the drop off at Clementi, yeah. we definitely saw squid oh, yeah, in there. Yeah. And we hooked and caught someone squid. Yeah, sure. I know you were yeah. doing the squid thing on the market deep. squid and, and they were biting at night. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, so yeah. I think it's whatever the most of is around, obviously right. too. I'm sure there's a lot of stuff those things are eating, but you know, what we're seeing and picking up on on the days of fishing, I mean, we're seeing you know, the, the abundance, right? Yeah. The anchovies and the squid probably the, being the, the top too, I would think. It's neat to look at the slow-mo in this and see those fish coming out with their mouths open. You know, so much of that when it's happening in real time, you really can't, you can't, you can't really see what's going You're all charged up and you want to cast and all that. But if you look close at the slow-mo and see the little anchovies coming out of the water. So and they're sweet. not little, they're actually big anchovies. Yeah. But those things are just mowing on that anchovy. And, and during that filming, we had several times where, where Michael would slide the boat into the foam or turn everything off. And the meat would come underneath the pulpit of the boat and it would be down glare so you could really see it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the tuna would be glancing off the bow of the boat. Yep. Eating that stuff. We got that. It's so <laughs> sit there times, and just but every once in a while it all comes together and you get that Panama yellowfin scene right yeah. next to your boat. Yeah. Dude, we just a lot of times we just stop yeah. and take it in. I mean this you're you, you never better know, enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, once everybody broke off on this deal here and the the cameraman threw out and it broke off and everything. They were getting flossed off, even though it was heavy line, but there were so many fish that were getting flossed off. And we just all sat there and just looked at it and he's flying the drone. Sure. It was, it was just awesome. one of those rare sights. Yeah, it was, it was totally awesome. Yeah. So let's talk about what we knew about bluefin before this. Um, in modern times, right? When I think of bluefin, big bluefin on this coast, I think of two things, Guadalupe and Mike Lackey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you, you can't say big bluefin. Yeah. And Guadalupe without Lackey, he's a great guy. I know him very casually, but like, what do you guys know about Guadalupe? I've never even been, yeah. uh, and it, it's it's something I definitely got to do, but I've never made the trip. Like, what do you know about those days? You guys get to do any of that? I did. I went down there. I went down there on a boat called the Zopalote way back in the day. It was a seventy foot boat that was owned by a friend of mine, Bruce Kessler, here in San Diego, mm-hmm. and we went down there. And Gary Graham was with us. Sure. And um, we took an inflatable, had a bait tank in it, and put it in the water. And Gary and I caught the scads. Yep. and went over next to Monster Rock and put the scads out and started slow trolling. And I remember I was I brought tuna club tackle because I was trying to catch a What year fish. was this? This was, oh, well, that's a good question. It was in the late 90s. Oh, no. okay, so not 96, that long. 96, 97? Kind of the so tail end, probably. On the tail end of it. It was, right. it was just coming to an end. And we trolled those scads around, and I'll never forget seeing the fish underwater, and a, a bunch of flying fish came jumping out, not the giants like we have, but smaller ones. And this thing bit my scad, and I got tight, and I was on 30 pound Dacron, and everything was cool. And the fish, I was like, oh, I think I have a chance to land in the chair. Sure. And then the thing just blistered me and, and ended up spooling the reel and coming up. <laughs> but I saw a little bit of it, and we caught, uh, I think we caught an 80 pounder and some 40 pounders, but it was just transitioning out at that period of time. I, I kind of missed the reel, okay. the Dave Denholm, Jim Jank sure. of it. You okay. know? Yeah. The same guy I said mentioned that uh, went up and targeted the big bluefin up north. I mean, he took the uh, his boat, his Pacifica, down there uh, on quite a few trips and oh, successfully yeah. landed and brought back to the tuna club quite a few Guadalupe bu- buttons, you know, button fish, you know, okay. fish that qualified for his button that way. And he was down there flying kites that you know he probably bought from the east coast because of the time lapse from a hundred years ago. You know, they started in Catalina, they ended up becoming modified and used on the east coast and. They took some kites to Guadalupe and fished those scad mackerel out of a kite, and then they were really effective. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's what that's what clicked. Now we're like getting opportunities, right? Yeah. Several yeah. shots of these fish. Denholm and Jenks and Gary Graham. And there was there was a half a dozen tuna club guys that went down there and caught their button fish. Sure. Down in Guadalupe. Okay. And the tuna club made an exception for the waters immediately around Guadalupe that you could you could catch a bluefin there bring it back to Catalina and weigh it. Same yeah. stock at the end of the day. Count for your yeah. fish. Yeah, so. that makes sense. So. It's funny, I, I think that just reminded me of a story, like we were out when we had all those bluefin that you could never catch, we'd be chasing them around, mm-hmm. running them down, throwing friggin' trout lures in there, anything we could get yeah. you know, to, to get them to eat. 
and we couldn't get bites. And then one day we just got over it and we had a kite, put the kite out, a little double trouble rig, a couple yeah. sardines, and we picked away at the biggest bluefin we'd ever caught locally, yeah, which right. are like 50 to 65 pound fish. And we have people going by us all day long, like, hey, Ben Franklin, making fun of us on the radio and stuff. Sure. We must have drank a case of beer and caught a limit of bluefin using the, it was the Port of Vallarta is what taught us the double trouble. But exactly. I'm like, man, we're never going to catch these things. Let's throw a kite out over the side and crack a couple and, you know, make some lunch, see what happens. And it totally worked. You bet. You know. Michael and I did the same thing because I had the, the benefit of fishing so much down in Florida and fishing with my buddy Bert Moss down there, who taught me how to kite fish specifically fish and sailfish. And so I had Bert send me a couple of kites and then we had the AFCO kite and we started fishing mackerel off the kite in the early days and, and we had immediate success with it. Kind of like what you did, fishing two mackerel. And to this day, we still do well. Yeah, it's yeah. a very effective technique. Yeah, totally, totally. Um, let's, what, what was the consensus or was there any major change documented in why they left in the 1918-ish range? I mean, was there an El Nino? Was there a storm? What do you know about that? I, you know, there was nothing, they had no studies of the currents or the water temp or anything else. So those guys in those days blamed it on the on the, on the the purse fleet. They, they called them the round, back then? Oh yeah, there was tons of, they called them round haul net boats. And they all started netting in the Lee of Catalina. And that's what, what the tuna club guys all said caused the bluefin to go away. I kind of think it was a shift in currents. I was gonna say, it was you think that, that yeah, some tiny little net boat could have made that big of an impact? Yeah, I mean, you're talking hard about to say, dropping, right? Yeah, yeah, drop of water in an ocean. Yeah. If you you know, if you ask me, for sure. Um, yeah, commercial fishing's getting been getting blamed for a hundred years <laughs> in the county now. Yeah. That's good. Um, let's see. Okay, so the the current migration we're going through now, over the last five years, I would say the first year we had, and this is sixteen on, we had a lot of that popper fish, mm -hmm. mid grade sixty eighty one twenty. And I'd say the second year we had a lot of popper fish again. Didn't start as early. I mean, how do you see that transitioning right now? I, I, I feel like we're getting bigger fish and more fish for yeah. the last few years. We had tremendous, you know, popper and surface fishing this year, you know, right close to Laguna Beach and Newport yeah, and all that. Fantastic. It, was, it was great fishing in there and it was mixed fish. I mean, there was 40 to 60s and there was fish over 200 pounds. Yeah. And, you know, we were fishing the kite 10 miles off Laguna and you had a 168 and a 208 and a bunch of big fish. So I, I think, I think the methods that, that we're using are just getting better and better. There's more people that are that are aware of using kites and you poppers bet. and Absolutely. all that. I, I don't think the fish have changed. I think the methods have changed. Yeah. People are getting better at landing. Well, I definitely think we saw them a lot closer this year in a lot of cases. I mean, we beat the heck out of them from 20 to 30 miles out from high. <laughs> yeah. Like, it was every day. It, it was phenomenal. Yeah. Something's definitely changing. Maybe it's for the better. Maybe next year is the year the 500 show up. And we would all hope so. I know there's there was several documented fish that were in the high threes and over four. So yeah. who knows? Right. Who knows? Something to look forward to. That's for sure. For sure. I think hopefully we'll know by I don't know March, April. Kind of cure the anxiety. Once yeah. you hear the yeah. same guys start saying the same big volumes of them, I'm yeah. like, okay, it's going to happen again. We can relax. Or Absolutely. a fish is caught off calling it or whatever that may be. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go ahead and take a quick commercial break here, and uh, we'll be back with you guys shortly. There's a new leader in fluorocarbon. Introducing Aftco Psycho Pro, an ultra premium fluorocarbon leader with secure spool, a 100% custom formula developed with Sunline Japan for optimum leader performance. Made for game fish, not lab testing. Psycho Pro features industry leading tensile strength, abrasion resistance, and break energy ratings for an unfair advantage over the competition. Oh yeah, secure spool makes leader storage a cinch. Invisibility to generate bites and durability to follow through. Psycho Pro from Aftco. Any fish, any water. Okay, guys, we're back. Um, okay, 
we're going to take a few minutes here, about 10 minutes or so. We're going to answer some of the questions that have come from you online. Um, first question I've got here in front of me is John Lincoln wants to know, Greg, is this next year going to be the year for a linen line kite fish? Well, there's there's been plenty of kite fish caught on linen line. I mean, it's, already, it's already happened. I mean, is it going to be the year that someone catches a kite fish on linen that's a club record? I hope so. How big is that? It uh, depends on the size of the linen. If it's, it's linen. So on, on the heaviest linen, which is 24 thread, which this is, that fish would have to weigh, I believe, 261. So to be over 261 to be a club record on 24 thread linen tap. And when it comes to the reels, uh, that, that you're fishing a senator there, right? I fish. This is an antique reel. So we can in the tuna club for antique tackle. They only recognize pre 1952 okay. reels and wooden rods. Okay. So that's a that's a 19 late 1940s pen dyno. That has not changed much. They haven't changed hardly at all. I had no idea. I would have yeah. seriously been no. thought that that was like the 80 or 90s. And I'll tell you something. It worked perfect. Really? Yeah. No problem. What are the drag? Uh, it's got HD 100 drags in it. So okay. it's got modern drags in it. The okay. drag was perfect when I caught my button fish on it, which was 130 pounds. Not a giant, but on this tackle, yep. it worked perfect. I mean, you're cheating. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and, and the right guides. Yeah, that doesn't hurt, that doesn't hurt either. Yeah, what right. did they do for guides back in the day? Is it just metal ring? So they had they had mostly ring guides. They were kind of on a high frame. Finor had some, some very early roller guides okay. that were not real effective. They had a whole conglomeration of stuff built in basements and garages. Um, a lot of it built by the Baumhoff brothers up in Hollywood. Okay. They also built reels that were super high end. This was all elite stuff back in the day. Oh, I'm sure. So, it had to be cut edge, but right? Jay Seattle, someone who invented that guide in Newport Beach in his basement, that's his bamboo rod. And that's his heavy tackle rod. Wow. So, he was a tuna club guy? He was not a tuna club guy. He was a Balbo Angling Club guy. But back then, that's all you had for fishing rods. They didn't have fiberglass. That's crazy. So. Okay, next uh, question. Let's see. How far would you guys run to find the tuna? Well, we weren't there, but to find the tuna back in the early 1900s. Did they run all the way out to the banks and zones we're fishing today or focus more right around Catalina? Long point to the east end. That's what yeah. my understanding. <laughs> yeah. About as far as you can paddle. Yeah, about as far as you can row or use a little one lung, little five horsepower motor. I was going to say those were the options, right? You had a dude rowing for you yeah. or you had like, it was like not even five horsepower, like three and a half horse or something. Yeah, just a little one lunger that. Bang away. Must have been a lot of fish around. I was going to say, yeah. it must have been easy yeah. back then in order to just get to them. Yeah. But, like, what did you do when there was current? Or a fish told you, like, you got to think there's some lives lost at sea, some crazy stories. You read stories from the day, and every kind of combination of guys having to come ashore way down the beach, guys blowing off the beach and eventually right, yeah. having to row back, and all night drifts, and people with their hands bleeding, and their boats broken up, and it, it, all that stuff happened. It all happened. <laughs> That's crazy. I mean, they're so tough and so hard to land on modern gear. It's almost hard to imagine. Yeah. Um, let's see. Swimbait Jack has a great question for Ryan. What's the best way to take care of the fish from the moment it's gaffed until it's on the plate? That's one That's thing we have not touched question. on. And I know Ryan knows it better than anybody. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of uh, circumstantial uh, in terms of the type of trip you're on and how big the fish is. But, um, you know, the, the best method for any fish that you're going to kill and hope to get some quality table fare out of is to yeah, kill it immediately at, at as, as efficiently as possible. I like to kill them outside the boat. As soon as I gaff them, I prefer to hit them with a bat or spike them or do whatever. And, you know, keeping them outside the boat in the water will, you know, eliminate bruising that happens on the deck. That's a big problem. You know, the fish are really delicate and, uh, you know, a hot tuna on the deck of a boat really, it, it's doing damage to the meat, right? So eliminate that and then, you know, getting them cold fast, right? So the fastest uh, way to cold is a uh, saltwater brine, water and ice, you know, and definitely less water and more ice. But, you know, having some liquid in your ice is going to bring your core temperature down and gilling and gutting your fish. Super critical. I was going to say, yeah, that's become really standard. You I are, for a you are pulling a, a super hot little dart out of the water. I mean, that thing is just cooking inside. So, yeah. you know, getting the core temperature brought down cold is uh, absolutely imperative okay. to, to quality. And I'd say for us, it's like four to one on the ice to water. Easily. Typically. Easily. Yeah, I mean, a lot of guys say, oh, you just make a brine, throw two 20 pound bags in there. Negative. Double edged sword of the brine. You know, you make a brine, you burn ice, right? Yeah. So a lot of guys are in a, in a tough position, uh, you know, with ice being, a, you know, I can't take enough ice to accommodate the size fish that we're catching. Good, yep. pr good problem to have. But, you know, you end up at the dock with a lot of, a lot of you know, you should have had a lot more ice than you did. Uh, you know, take advantage of the temperature of the water. We have, you know, a lot of cold water here in California. Uh, you're bringing a potentially 90 degree fish down to the temperature of the ocean. 
by giving it a you know 10 to 15 minute soak. Slow down, kill your fish, gill it and gut it. You know, take your pictures, hang it by a tail rope for 15 minutes. Bring bring that core temp down, get it into your eyes. You're going to save a lot that way. It might not seem like it at first, but you do that a couple times, you'll get back to the dock. Up, you know, super cold, high quality, really nice meat. And another thing I touch on too is once that fish is dead, if you have the ability, leave it on ice for a couple of days. If you can, a yeah. chef had taught me that years ago. Yeah. I'm not the biggest local yellowtail fan yep. of eating. I just made sure. a ton of it as a kid. Take your next local yellowtail, gill and gut it, leave them in an ice slurry for two days and then make sashimi out of that guy, night and day. Yeah. I mean, it's a different fish altogether. The bluefin is exactly the same way. The rigor releases, the meat is more firm. And then another trick that we do, and I think you guys probably do it as well. If we know we're gonna make sashimi, we take a big log of that fish, we wrap it in paper towels, mm -hmm. put it on a plate in the fridge, change the paper towels a couple times the first yeah. day, one time the second, and then serve it. And again, pull the moisture out, allow the meat to relax. You bet. It makes the best product you've ever had. Guys are like, oh, we ate it right out of the water. It was delicious. I'm like, not for me. Well, there's a lot of water weight to a limit. You know, muscle yeah. tissue is mostly water weight. So the longer you can let a piece of fish sit in your fridge and, and let paper towels absorb that moisture, or even on the bone, they're, you know, they're getting rid of that moisture on the bone. And, and you know, a few days later is really going to be your absolute best piece of, of fish, you know, and then keeping your meat dry, you know, take home those fillets, try and keep them dry. Yeah, we've evolved to no water cleaning. Yeah. We use zero water. Right. What so we, we cut the fish. Yeah. We don't let the, the, the meat side of the fish hit the cutting board. Yep. We lay it on its skin. We take the skin off. We pick it up with paper towels. We wrap it in paper towels and we put it in a bag. Okay. It never touches water. That's what we're doing too. Yeah. No yeah. water. And you don't, the bacteria that that skin leaves on the cutting board, you do not want that on the meat. I no, see guys. wash it constantly. Yeah, it, I'm in the same boat. But yeah. no fillets in the bait tank or, you know, massive amounts of water on the fillet. We use no water. Yeah. No water, yeah. No water. Yeah. And do you do a quick fresh water rinse before you serve it? I, I, I do not rinse my meat at all. Really? Yeah, no. Paper towels. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. That's cool. I mean, unless you've got some situation where, you know, you were in a hurry. I mean, you end up back at the dock pretty late a lot of times. Yeah. Sometimes oh, yeah. you got to fillet them and just shove them in Ziploc bags and deal with them later. So, you know, use your best judgment. Common sense goes a long way when you're making fish, especially raw fish. But getting your fish cold, killing them quickly, don't let them bruise. And, uh, you know, give them a couple days in the fridge or on ice if you can. What do you, what about your take on uh, freezing before you eat them all? Uh, I don't think it's necessary. Uh, you know, and again, back to common sense there, you know, if all of a sudden you look at a piece of tuna and you're like, well, that's, you know, something I've never seen before in that, you know, you may, maybe we don't want to eat that piece raw, you yeah. know, but I think for the most part, if you've gotten a fish that you caught and, you know, it's within a week's time and it was well kept and not exposed to, you know, any, any temperature above, you know, really, really cold, you're fine, I'm you know. You. Yeah, I, I've eaten never, I've tons of raw fish. Never had a problem. Yeah, um, it's raw fish. Anything could be a problem at some point in your life, but I don't think it's an issue. I'm with you. I'm yeah. going 100. A lot of guys are so freaked out about that. It's like, no, yeah. we've all eaten a million tons of you know tuna right on the off the back of the boat or whatever on a boat. You bet. Like, yeah, yeah I don't all the time. Okay, here's a little bit of a controversial one. I think you guys will get a rise out of. Justin wants to know a little bit about the how, when, and where of spreader bars. For bluefin everywhere yeah <laughs> you like them <laughs> uh, you know it's uh so here's the problem um you know you got a lot of guys out there and they're trolling spreader bars too far behind their boat yep. and the reason that started was because the first guys that started catching fish on them we're doing it because we're out on these days with no wind and we're looking at breezer schools and i want to get my spreader bar through that breezer school because i can't get my kite into it because i don't have any wind to do it in order to make a loop around a breezer school and get your spreader bar through it well you, you need it to be really far away not necessary we started bringing those spreader bars close to the boat fifth sixth and seventh weight yep. wind your spreader bars in they yep. don't need to be a mile behind the boat the only reason nobody really likes them is because it's a problem when other guys are flying their kite you're you're always looking around and oh my god that guy's got a spreader bar you know thousand feet behind his boat i just don't believe that's necessary I'm with you. and that's what i think the problem is i'm not opposed to any method that goes out and catches fish you know but the tanner bank with 30 sport boats right. and 100 private boats and you got your your spreader bar back 900 feet and you're waving an orange flag yep so people don't run over it it's just idiocy common sense we yeah. caught several big over 150 pound fish on our fifth sixth and seventh weight yep. right behind the boat yeah so. and i know a couple of guys that swear by spreader bars and it's the same thing and when we talk about wakes 
50 yards, 60 yards, 70 yards, anything past that, you're going to kill your crew member. Really Look at the East Coast away. guys. Exactly. Why are, they're, they're not trolling their stuff, you know, a yeah. million feet behind them. And phones. one other point I'd like to make, because I have gotten in murderous rages a couple of times this year. Sure. If you see a guy with a kite with a flying fish hanging from it, stay the hell away with your spreader bar. Right. I cannot tell you early in the season, probably out of your range, but I'm feeding them into breezers down here. And I've got these, they're all excited to catch a bluefin. They can't, you know, it takes a little bit of talent to see a breezer. Yeah. And I'm dro- trying to drop a flying fish in and here comes spreader bar Bob <laughs> mowing over my school, like common courtesy. There's so much fish out there. When you see boats and you chase those, you're not gonna catch fish because those fish have been molested. Stay to the outside. You know, I, I know you guys are like me. I'm like, okay, there's everybody. Where can I sneak off to yep. and catch a few, you know? Yeah, being out of Redondo, we spent so much time up west that, that we avoid a lot of that, but we drive away from the people. I yes. not, I roll up on the on the tanner in the middle of the night and I see all the lights, you know, in the middle, early in the morning. I want to go somewhere else. Yeah. I don't want to be in the middle of, of the cluster. It's just not, it's not what I want to do. And unfortunately, the cluster will find you a lot of times, oh, yeah. too. You get a couple of fish going or whatever, yeah. you're getting piled yeah. on. Or, yeah. Welcome to Southern California. Uh, it's part of the deal. <laughs> you totally got to, you have to, you know, know how to work through it. Yeah. But it can be frustrating as heck, man. And this year, like, I told myself I wasn't going to blow up. And I just try to educate guys. Literally yeah. pull up next to you and be like, hey, man, here's what just happened. Please try to, and most of the time, they're like, hey, thanks. They just didn't know any better. Right. You know, and we, we've got the boat rentals down here, and when those fish are inside 30, 40 miles, oh, my gosh. We yeah, actually caught a spreader bar. I mean, we had a guy come around us, take a spreader bar right through our kite bait, hook, hook caught a spreader bar. I just put it in low gear, wound a spreader bar right to the boat, disconnected it, and threw it in the cockpit, and yes. uh, we sorted it out later, you know, but it's like, you just don't need it out there that far. No, and, if, and if you can't drive your boat in a way to be respectful of the other fishing that's happening around that zone, then you're going to end up with people upset about it. Yeah. You know? It's tough. It is sometimes it is hard to get the job done out nice. there through no, <laughs> no fault of your own. Sure. I have enough trouble on my own catching fish. I don't need yeah. anybody else. We're all trying to learn every day we're out there. Totally. You know, we're, everybody's trying to improve, right? Totally. So, um, Here's another one. Logan wants to know, looking for, uh, let's see, a little bit more about general tactics of locating bluefin. Looking for surface signal, birds, meter marks, all of the above. Well, for us, it's gyros. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for us, it's gyros. It's, it's We're in the gyros, two or three sets going constantly and constantly looking for, you know, you know, sometimes it's just very minor sonic. I mean, a few birds, a few white birds flying around, a few... Uh, when you say few, white birds, and maybe that'll help guys out. Turns. Turns. Yeah. Turns are your friends. Yeah. Everybody else is late to the party. You're like... I say that all the time, like the seagulls, the pelicans, are two stupidest birds in our ocean, right? Sure. Turns are hunters, everybody yep. else is following them around. People don't realize that turns daisy chain. They they spread out on the ocean as far apart as they can get and still see each other. Right. And so when one turns and goes to the fish, yep. and then you see them all turn and go to the yep. fish, exactly. they daisy chain each other. So when we see a white bird, Michael, a lot of times he'll follow the white bird exactly. or look in the direction he's going. and. All of a sudden, you find something. That was really a prevalent tactic early in the season this year. I mean, there was a lot of fish that was just south of the border here in San Diego, and there were several days where I was down there on my skiff, find one white turn one and just dipping and swooping, not really feeding, no. not really doing anything that interesting. Yeah. And very easily, you could overlook that bird. But if you could get up on that bird in front of it, whatever direction, anywhere near it, if you could get a bait in that zone, you were bit. Yep, that was the breezer thing early on. They you were, were bit. They weren't pushing bait, but the turns were like, I know these guys are And there was the yeah. boats yeah. fishing yeah. all around yeah. that, not catching. Yeah. And there was a few guys tuned into those turns Correct. that were consistently catching. Fish. And not just seeing the turns, but reading the turns. Yeah. Like when that bird flashes, he's not doing that for nothing. You right. see him flash, you know he's on something. You, bet. you see him dip. You see them kind of bank, they're definitely on something that they think is going to give them free anchovies, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that that's so key. And, and I mean, that really goes with yellowfin fishing, yellow tail fishing, any of that stuff. Yeah. Learning the water to Toronto, Toronto, everything. But you really got to use your eyes. Burn your eyes out. Yeah. Right? I mean, gyros are always going to win the, win that out there for sure. And we're smaller boat guys, right? Yes. So we don't have sonar. I've got speed. You've got a little bit better visibility. I think you got to play to your strengths. If yep. you're in a little tiny boat, you know, spreader bar fishing is probably more for you, honestly. If you can't see, sure. you can't get up high enough, they will find you on that spreader bar if you pull the thing long and enough. And cover ground, you know, you yeah. gotta move around. Don't get hung up on a drift with a bunch of boats somewhere that are all just on a drift. That that drive away. You t- I totally agree, yeah. yeah. And be uh, fidgety and impatient in the bluefin game. Yeah. Really work, you gotta go out and put in work. Get out there and put your time in. 
Uh, let's see, Brian asked if we could expect the bluefin to become more of a staple on the Central Coast, and if you would wish, well, if you would fish for them any differently up here. Uh, as far as fish for them differently on the, on the Central Coast versus here, I, I don't think so, although they do seem to bite the troll better up there. I was mm -hmm. going to say. They, they, they do catch them on more standard methods up there. For there. sure. I mean, you can drag a Rapala out here until you're blue in the face and you're never going to hook a bluefin on it for whatever reason. But up there, they pull feathers and drag Rapalas and they catch a lot of bluefin. So I think if the fish are there, go with what works. And they have the weather up there is their big issue. It's, you know, up there it blows 30, 35, 40. Down here it blows 20, 25 on the back base. And downriggers. Everybody's got downriggers yeah. up there. Yeah. They, yeah. they know how to use them. Yeah, yeah it's crazy. I mean, fish are caught on Gucci's and stuff on yeah. downrigger. Guys yeah. are out there, you know, using their salmon techniques and lo and behold, it worked. I think the thing that I don't, I've never gone up there to target them, but I talked to a lot of guys up there. They don't seem like they foam. And I think you right. miss out on the rest of the visual signal because the weather's so tough. Yeah. So if it was me, man, I'd be dragging spreader bars with a couple of nomads or Rapalas underneath them yeah. or something like that. And another lure that's been lost in big tuna fishing that works really, really well. And we did a lot of support of art is the big marauder. Yeah. Yep. A oh, big yeah. tuna, yeah. like a, the biggest one you can find, they yeah. will eat them and it seems I don't know, just exactly you pull those for Wahoo, but you know, that's another way to catch them and cover some ground for sure. Sure. Um, let's see. I mean, right. Always. This, always was a tough <laughs> one, man. this was a windy season. Thanks again, AFCO. We really appreciate Thanks, it. Guys. We all had a blast. Filet knives shouldn't be disposable. Introducing AFCO Filet Knives that are built to last. Designed in collaboration with Boker Germany, AFCO Knives feature 4116 German stainless steel bonded with titanium nitride to ensure optimum corrosion resistance and exceptional edge retention. A non-slip TPR handle maintains a firm grip when processing game fish. Premium in every sense, AFCO fillet knives are available in multiple length options to provide the right tool that gets the job done season after season. Fillet knives from AFCO. Any fish, any water.